Thanks very much. I'm excited to be here uh, talking about um, some of the hugest groups. So our setting is that for me, M is always going to be a topological manifold. You can think a smooth manifold if you like. You can think like the two sphere if you want to think very concretely. Um, all that I'll use uh, is that you know you can put a metric on the manifold if you like. So sometimes I'll talk about points being epsilon close, just fix a metric. Um, and then homeo of M is just the group of all homeomorphisms of this manifold. So continuous with continuous inverse. And the first point I want to make, which Sebastian already started to advertise, but I would like to really drill it home, is that uh, no matter which manifold you take, well, dimension, say, at least one, uh, the group of homeomorphisms is a huge group. Okay, so proof number one is I got invited to this conference. Uh, but uh, proof number two, uh, so let me give uh, proof, but some evidence. Uh, and and uh, like Sebastian, I claim that actually, even if you, I'm going to put a little zero there, as we often do, to say that what do I mean here is the I, actually the identity component of this group. Uh, and so what have I done? I identity component presumes some topology. You can put that compact open topology on this. If your manifold's compact, that's equivalent to saying a homeomorphism is close to the identity if it moves any point distance at most epsilon. Neighborhood basis of the identity requires taking you know, epsilon going to zero. Um, and so that gives us a natural topological structure. And I'll just talk about the identity component of this. So in uh, all nice situations, this is actually homeomorphisms that are isotopic to the identity. Uh, so just the identity component um, is already a huge group. And my evidence, okay. Uh, let me start with this, a case where the manifold is small as if you were trying to make this huge group as small as possible. Let's take M to be, uh, I don't know, like a compact interval. Okay. Uh, maybe I should have written this as like a closed interval. Okay, uh, in this case, the identity component of this group is just the those that it, that it, that um, preserve order here, preserve orientation. You don't flip the endpoints. So I could have also written homeo plus for orientation preserving. Okay, uh, this is isomorphic to the group of all orientation homeomorphism, preserving homeomorphisms of the real line, right? Right, the line is topologically the open interval. And if I preserve the two ends, then I can compactify this and a homeomorphism of this space will extend to its kind of two point compactification and vice versa, you'll restrict by this. Uh, this so this contains lots of subgroups. So this uh, group contains for instance, well, I don't know, it contains like R acting by all the translations, right? This big abelian group. Bigger than that, uh, if you like Lie groups, it contains the universal cover of FL2R, uh, which is one of those nonlinear Lie groups. Uh, it contains, you know, not just R, but like arbitrarily many copies of R and direct product. Um, actually, better than that, by dividing the real line into countably many disjoint intervals and pretending each one of these was actually uh, the line, right? There's, there's I, there's another copy of I. I could uh, put uh, inside of this group, uh, it also contains a copy of an infinite direct product uh, of itself. I don't know countably many times, right? Think of a copy that lives here, a copy that lives here, a copy that lives here. You can do whatever you want. Independently, they all commute. Right. Okay, uh, so this is already bad. I have a group that contains it, uh, something that looks much bigger than itself, so it must be huge. Uh, it also contains, and this is um, part of the theory of left order little groups, which I won't have time to talk much about, but it contains a copy of every 
finitely, well, I'll say countable. Every countable group G such that uh, G admits a total order. I don't know, less than G that is invariant under left multiplication. So if you haven't heard of orderable groups before this beautiful, fascinating theory, this is just an algebraic condition that actually implies you can force this group to act on the line. And many groups that you see in geometric topology, like surface groups, various three manifold groups, braid groups, uh, uh, have these kind of orders. Okay, well, okay, so that's just a one dimensional manifold, okay? It only gets worse. Uh, further evidence if the dimension of M is bigger than two, at least two, then my group of homeomorphisms of the compact interval embeds as a subgroup of the group of homeomorphisms of M. Okay. Here's, a, here's a cartoon picture of how, how would you do that? Well, uh, inside of M, uh, let's call this dimension N or something like this. Inside of M, just working a little in a little chart, I can put a copy of a N minus one sphere across the interval. It looks like an annulus, right? And while this gives me a bunch of copies, let's draw it as if N minus one was one. So I look like this, circle cross interval. This gives me a bunch of, you know, what I'm thinking of parallel copies of the interval in M. And I can define, you know, I can map from homeomorphism of the interval into homeomorphism of M. Uh, well, it this this in, can be mapped to some homeomorphism of F n minus one cross zero one by just doing, I don't know, uh, nothing on the S n minus one factor and F on uh, the interval factor. And because I fixed the endpoints, right? This thing is the identity map on the boundary. And so I can extend it by the identity to the rest of M. So whatever you were, the way to think of this is whatever you were doing to the interval, right? Just do that on all these parallel copies of the interval at once. Okay. Um, so this is some advertisement for hugeness. Another advertisement for hugeness was an open question that Sebastian mentioned that I like to reiterate, which is that, uh, as far as we know, once the dimension is at least two, it may be possible that every single torsion-free finitely generated group embeds in the homeomorphism group of your manifold. Okay, I believe that this is false, but we don't know how to prove it. Mm -hmm. uh, a further piece of evidence that I will just mention in passing, this is sort of to give you a flavor for this, um, is, uh, uh, geometric perspective. So there is a natural, uh, meaning kind of well defined up to quasi isometry in the same way that you define uh, word metrics on finitely generated groups. Um, metric on the group of homeomorphisms of a manifold, uh, the isotopically trivial one. Okay. Uh, this is in the sense of uh, Christian Rosenthal's work. He has a generalization of the entirety of geometric group theory to groups that are not locally compact or or low or discrete and finitely generated, or not locally compact and compactly generated. So huge groups. Uh, for certain classes of Polish groups, there is a way to meaningfully talk about their sort of quasi-isometry type. And homeomorphism groups of manifolds fit into this framework, right, which I won't have time to say much about, except that you can sort of do geometric group theory with them. But as soon as, say, the dimension of your manifold is at least two, and its fundamental group is infinite, uh, this geometry gives them an absurdly large size, 
uh, the group of homeomorphisms of your manifolds contains quasi isometrically embedded infinite dimensional linear spaces, Sigmanic spaces. So while you might try and do a very natural version of geometric group theory with this, as soon as your manifold is kind of topologically interesting, uh, uh, to say like what its quasi-isometry type is, is just almost intractable because it's so big. We don't know how to talk about it. Um, and finally, I guess my last comment of evidence is that on the algebraic structure, and that is the fact that the algebraic structure of a homeomorphism group is like big or rich enough to actually recover the manifold. And no, uh, to recover. And this is a, a classical theorem, the one I'm going to state. So this is due to Whitaker in 1963, I think. Which says that if, uh, say, M and N are closed manifolds and their groups of homeomorphisms, just the identity components, are isomorphic as abstract groups, forgetting the topologies, just, just, a, just group theoretic isomorphism. Okay. Then, M and N were actually the same manifold. They're homeomorphic. And moreover, this homeomorphism between them is what induced uh, this map. It was just by conjugation. And if the group theoretic is induced, it's just by this homeomorphism. If this, if this, if the, you know, the way you were, at, in, in, it's not quite the same as saying everything, every, you know, all the automorphisms of this group are inner. So I'm allowed to conjugate by something not isotopic to the identity. That's all that can happen. So whatever this, the algebraic structure of these groups are, it's enough to, to determine the entire manifold itself. Um, yikes. How do we understand such a huge group? Okay. so. Point two is, uh, nevertheless, uh, we have some tools. We have some tools to understand these groups or to understand their structure very broadly. And so what I want to do in this mini course is present you sort of with a showcase of tools. I've tried to pick out ones that are useful not only for homeomorphism groups, but tricks involving commutators, I don't know, things like this that are applicable um, to a broader class of groups. But for us, you know, our test examples will be homeomorphism groups of manifolds uh, to present kind of a toolkit of uh, what you what what surprising uh, things you might try and do to understand a unreasonably uh, a large group. And uh, I picked maybe three theorems to be our motivating, uh, motivating, uh, you know, entry points for each lecture. So here's, uh, here's kind of my outline, what we're gonna do. So today is going to be focused around uh, a theorem that I'm gonna just label as classical because there's a few ingredients due to different people and, and I'll tell you who did what at what time when we get to them. Um, uh, and this is the theorem that says something about the algebraic structure of these groups, namely that the group of homeomorphisms of a manifold, uh, identity component, what else do I need? I'm gonna say a closed, closed manifold. So compact no boundary. Uh, algebraically, this is a simple group, meaning uh, there are no non-trivial normal subgroups. Any normal subgroup is just the identity of the whole group itself. This is kind of crazy. You have a group rich enough to tell you what the manifold was, and yet like it has no normal subgroups. Uh, so that's kind of something about the algebraic structure, and that's what we'll do today. Uh, the second theorem, that we'll talk about next lecture. It's not just about something purely algebraic, 
but it relates the algebraic structure to the topology. Uh, and this was proved uh, by Rosendahl, uh, by Rosendahl and Zaleski for in dimension one, Rosendahl in dimension two, and then I generalized this in arbitrary dimension. And it says that not only does the algebraic structure of this group remember the manifold, the algebraic structure of this group remembers the topological structure of this group. Okay, well, how? Uh, the statement is that the group of homeomorphisms of a manifold has, uh, again, the same assumptions for simplicity. At some point, maybe I'll say something about manifolds with boundary. Um, this has a property called automatic continuity. Okay. What does that mean? That means that any just purely group theoretic homomorphism from this group with its compact open topology, the natural one you would put on it, things move that don't move points far close to the identity. Uh, from here to uh, any group, wait, I can't say literally any group, right? Because I could take this group and then put the discrete topology and that would not be continuous. Uh, so the restriction I put this is any group whose topology is separable. I don't want it to be too giant. I want it to have some, you know, countable basis. Um, uh, any such homomorphism is necessarily continuous. A purely algebraic we define map between groups is forced to respect their topologies as well. And, and, and we're going to prove that in lecture two using some tricks that we learned today. And then my last piece of the plan uh, is uh, to talk about uh, in lecture three, well, what are maybe some like non-trivial examples, right? If this, if there were basically no actions of this group on anything, or, or if there were no homomorphisms from this group to anything else, then this is not a very impressive theorem, right? We want to give this some content. So uh, uh, this is about the problem of, of finding interesting examples of group homomorphisms from homeomorphism groups to other big group, right? The, the G better be big because this guy is simple. So this morphism is going to be injective or trivial, right? I don't care about trivial ones. It's going to be injective. So G better be pretty big. Uh, so um, I'll say maybe informally, there are lots of examples of non-trivial homomorphisms. When I take G to be a different homeomorphism group, okay, possibly, possibly take, take, take M way bigger dimension than M or something, give yourself lots of, writ, of wiggle room, okay? And, uh, well, this is no longer a theorem. This is a um, idea or something like this. Uh, and uh, we have tools to classify these, or at least to start to. And so part of what I'll pitch in lecture three is, so I'm gonna pitch some precise version of classification of some cases that is joint work of myself and Lei Chen. And I'll pitch some next steps and open problems uh, of what, what these things might look like. Okay. All right, so uh, that's where we're headed. Um, let's uh, start with my step one today some of these uh, classical tools towards proving this simplicity theorem. Yeah. What you say simple means algebraically simple? Or yes. Simple, but no, I mean algebraically simple. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah, let's say this. Okay. Um, okay, so the first tool will be for this is, uh, a previously organized thing, but I want it here for now. So tool one is the fragmentation lemma. Okay, so uh, let me write down some some uh, definitions to make my life easier. So definition number one is that 
uh, for some, this is more like notation, I guess. If I have a homeomorphism, I'm going to write uh, fix F for the set of points it fixes. X and M, F of X equals X. And the support, support of F is defined to be uh, for basically the complement of this. Uh, but somehow for historical reasons, uh, people like to take the closure of this. All right, I'm so you're not confused. It's the closure of the points that are moved from it. Okay, and so here's uh, a theorem called the fragmentation lemma, but it's substantial enough. I think it should be called a theorem. And uh, one statement of it is the following. Slightly different than what Sebastian said. Uh, let's take an open cover. So let O be an open cover of M. And I'm going to assume M compact. Okay. Uh, the set, let's let I go S sub O for being supported on my cover. Uh, let's define this to be the set of homeomorphism so that there exists some set your cover uh, such that the supports of F is contained in this set U. Uh, that's a definition. So the theorem says that X of O generates the identity component of the whole homeomorphism. Uh, if F is not compact, this set will not generate the whole homeomorphism group, but it's because if I take a finite product of these things and my cover with my little pre compact sets, I'll only ever get something that kind of like moves points within some pre some compact set, right? Some finite unit of elements in my cover. So I have, I have no hope. If M is not compact, what I generate always is the uh, identity component of the set of homeomorphisms of the manifold who have compact. Uh, but uh, you don't need to remember that part. Um, we can, you can pretend all your manifolds are compact now. Well, I'll, I'll write it though, because this is important. If M not compact, S, oh, it's a set, generates identity components of that of. With well, this is if you assume that uh, your object is by relatively compact systems. Uh, I guess you'll all you'll always generate this, right? Yeah. So, so technically, what I said it's true. But yes, you may generate more. As for instance, if my cover was just like a single set and it was M. Yeah. Um, what is the element of this cover Um. So this says that for any cover, this thing generates. But you can imagine like the case that Sebastian was talking about is a special one where you cover by falls. OK, uh, so I will um, say some words about the proof of this in a minute. But first, I want to tell you how powerful this tool is. Uh, Here is a quick consequence of this uh, toward our eventual goal. All right, so um, maybe a first thing to try and check if you want to prove a group as simple as the, the commutator subgroup is the normal subgroup, right? And so it better be true that the commutator subgroup of, of, of this group happens to be the whole thing, right? So, uh, and I'm going to prove this as a consequence of fragmentation. Every uh, element, let's write it this way, of my homeomorphism group is a product of commutators. For the word perfect for equal to your commutator subgroup, this says this group is algebraic. Okay. Uh, I'm going to prove the corollary right away. Okay. Well, uh, by fragmentation, what does that buy me? Uh, well, I can fix whatever color I, cover I want. Fix cover by some small balls or something like this. And then fragmentation implies that uh, it suffices to prove uh, that some F supported 
on a little ball. When I say ball on a manifold, I mean, you know, a embedded set the homeomorphic to a Euclidean ball, ball. F supported on a ball can be written as a product of commutators. Actually, I'm going to write it as a single commutator. Then everything in my generating set can be written as commutators, and I take products and I get everything as product of commutators. Okay. So here's the trick I have a little ball. I have some homeomorphism whose support is on the ball. I'm going to draw this cartoon, and that means that F just fixes all points outside of my ball B. Okay. And I'm going to actually choose these balls all small enough so that they're contained in, you know, nice local charts. And I'm pretending I'm just working in Rn, working a chart. Now, if you imagine an Rn, I can define, I could define like a little vector field that just, you know, I don't know, maybe has compact support is pushing all every point over in this direction, but I bump function it off so that I stop pushing at some point. Okay. And imagine, you know, flowing on this vector field or taking the time one map and iterating and looking at the images of B, you know. It'll go in this direction, destroying from itself. If I flow long enough, if I repeat, I'll get another copy, another one, and they'll get smaller and smaller and smaller. This is this, this sort of long-winded explanation is trying to make you believe that there exists some homeomorphism supported in my little chart. I'll call it T for translate over. So that all the iterates of this ball under T are pairwise disjoint. And you know, they'll accumulate somewhere they get smaller and smaller. Okay. Okay. So in solution one, there exists T uh, supported on a bigger ball, if I want, on my chart, such that T, K of B are pairwise disjoint. Uh, I only care about K greater than zero here. Okay. Uh, and now what am I going to do is I'm going to conjugate F by my map P to put little copies of it on all these different, on all these different balls. So let's see. Let, I don't know, big F be defined by, uh, I'm going to take a product or composition, I'll write product because I'm in a group, but I just mean composition here, of all of these different conjugates of my map. So let's see, if I want to have something that lives here, I should go backwards twice using T, T minus two, I'll do X, and then I'll go forwards twice, and I'll get something that's like basically what F would have been doing if it lived over here. Okay, except I didn't want two, I wanted I for various I's, uh, greater than equal to zero. And uh, this defines a homeomorphism of my manifold whose support is in this union of balls. Uh, maybe it's sanity check that it's continuous and continuous inverse and things like this on each ball at this such, like you're moving points left and left because these balls are getting smaller. So this, this makes sense. Okay, and now I claim that F is equal to a commutator of F and uh, T. So let's see, this is a picture, let me cartoon picture what big F is. It's like doing a translated version of little F over here, except here I mean like, I guess T, F, T inverse, et cetera. And here I've got another translate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if I consider instead the inverse of F, what's that going to do? It's exactly what cancels out. So it'll be doing F inverse here, a conjugate here, a uh, conjugate of F inverse by my other guy here, et cetera. Right. And if I conjugate F inverse by T, uh, which way do I want to shift this? Uh, I want to shift it over one. So let's see. I think I need to go uh, this way. 
I better draw a picture of P minus one of this where nothing's happening. If I conjugate the inverse by P, that's like shifting the picture over what but at once, right? So on here I'll be doing nothing. Here I'll be doing F inverse uh, conjugated by T. Here I'll be doing F inverse conjugated by T squared, et cetera, et cetera. This exactly cancels out with what X is doing, except on this first step. Okay. So if I take this composed with F, I, big F, I claim I exactly get little F. All right, is that what Mike back? Let me sanity check that on here, this composition is equal to F. And then you gotta check that it's the identity of it. So if I'm on this ball and I do T inverse, I go here, I do big F, big F does nothing here. Uh, I do, well, so it's inverse does nothing here. Then I do T, I end up back over here. Uh, I was just the identity map, and then I'm going to do what big F does, which agrees with little f here. Cool. All right, do the exact same mental check on each one of these other balls, and let's check that you're the identity outside, too. All right. Great. Okay, what do we just do? Uh, we QED'd this. Uh, I wrote F as a commutator. And uh, this is pretty, I made up that word. It's great. Um, and, and, and moreover, I did something uh, that will be handy in the in the future, right? If F lived on a little ball, I could do this whole procedure in any chart that contained that little ball. I just had to enlarge it a bit and I can fit this picture. And so F, big F and T really, you know, can, can live in the same domain that little F does. And that's a hint for some exercise that you'll do in the recitation section. Okay. Uh, great. That's um, perfectness. Priority number two is algebraic simplicity, namely, uh, if, let's see. Uh, What's a way I that'll suggest how to do this? Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Just if G is any homeomorphism of a manifold, all right, then uh, the normal closure of the subgroup generated by G is uh, the whole homeomorphism group. And uh, the proof of this is going to be more commutator tricks moving balls around. Uh, and I gave you an outline of it on the homework sheet to do in recitation. If you do nothing else on that sheet, uh, do this one. I put it first. It is very satisfying. All right. um, and I, I might run my recitations slightly different than other people. I will put you in groups to group work on problems of your choice. Uh, so think maybe a little ahead of time or just show up and you'll work on this one. This argument that goes from a proof of perfectness along this line uh, to simplicity is due, I think, to, to Epstein, BBA Epstein. Um, it's been around for a long time. Okay, so what remains in our big program here is to actually prove fragmentation. And I'll only have time to kind of give you uh, an outline, but I'm happy to say more later. And proving fragmentation is actually the hard part. All right, so how do you prove a statement like the fragmentation theorem there? Okay, so let's see. Uh, first reduction. Uh, if you take a connected topological group, this is a very general fact, you're generated by any neighborhood of the identity. And so uh, suffices to prove that my uh, S not there generate, S O generates some neighborhood of the identity, my homeomorphism group. Just because I started with a connected group. And it, actually, we're going to prove something stronger. We'll show, in fact, that the set of homeomorphisms so that you can write F as, I don't know, F1, F2, up to Fn, where um, 
Uh, let's see. I'm on a compact manifold is the setting I really care about. Um, uh, so let's suppose I pass to some finite subcover. Oh, is, I don't know, U1 up to UN. Right. So I'm actually going to show if I just take one guy from each in order and compose these all together. If I look at all ways of doing that, uh, this is a neighborhood of the identity. Oops. F, so that F is a product of these guys and the support of FI is contained in UI. This is a neighborhood of the identity. Or in other words, if you take some F that's like sufficiently close to the identity that moves all points of your manifold distance less than epsilon for some tiny, tiny, tiny little epsilon, then you can write it as a product of N things, each one having support on just one element of your fixed cover. Okay. So what's the idea of this? All right. So someone gave you a cover. Here are my, my nice open cover. I'm going to draw it like balls, but it doesn't be that way. And uh, so here's my, you know, U1, U2, et cetera. Shrink each of these sets a little bit so that you still have a cover. Okay. And actually, if you pay attention to all the details, you are, you're actually going to take like K nested sets where you have K plus one things in your cover and you want them all to be covers. But don't worry about that part. I just want to give you the idea. Okay. So I'm going to take choose some smaller shrinking of this so that I still get a cover. And now my neighborhood is the of the identity is I'm going to uh, suppose F close enough to identity such that F of V I, my smaller one is still inside of U I. So I'm, I'm, I'm a, a strictly smaller set. I take some F, it doesn't move it very far. I can't move it out of this slight enlargement. Okay. And so what you wanna show is that then in this case, if this is true, there exists some, I don't know, G. Uh, we'll do this for just the first one. I don't know, G1 supported on U1, okay, such that its restriction to V1 is the same as F, okay? And uh, that's all I want, actually. So what does that say? If F doesn't move this yellow set very far outside, of, and it doesn't move it outside of this U1 set, well, then there's something that just fixes the whole complement of it and does exactly the same thing, right? Well, then F uh, composed with G1 inverse. So G1 is a good candidate for like F1 in this thing because it's supported on one of my sets, right? So that's great. Like G G1 is actually going to be F1. And G1 inverse composed with F uh, uh, has smaller support. Right, it pointwise fixes uh, the place where they agree, V1. Great, so now what have I done? I've used one thing in my thing that I was gonna use as a generating set to make F less complicated. I've checked out this box. I now pointwise fix this big set. Okay, now I'm just gonna repeat this. Find a G2 that's supported on U2 so that when I uh, multiply it on the right, I Pointwise fix both V1 and V2. Okay. And then after however many steps I was, as long as I'm careful not to mess up what I did before, I iterate. And on my, you know, how many did I have nth step? I'm going to pointwise fix the whole union, V1 union up to Vn, which was my whole manifold. So as a strategy, and the hard part is executing this strategy, all right? Specifically, uh, this show the existence of a G1, which sounds so believable, uh, 
This part is non-trivial. And while you might be able to do it kind of by hand using a nice triangulation on a surface of dimension two, uh, uh, it was it's equivalent to some famous problems in topology from the 1960s, uh, along with the annulus conjecture and Shenfli's theorem. Uh, this was uh, is one formulation of something, or it's basically equivalent to something that was called the stable homeomorphism conjecture. Okay, from the 1960s, um, solved uh, by uh, along with kind of the annulus theorem uh, using Kirby's Paris trick. And uh, I sort of predicted that I would not get this far. So, so this is really this the stable homeomorphism conjecture basically asks if you have an open set in Rn and you move it a little bit, not too far, uh, just you, you take it, you use some abstract subset of Rn and you take an embedding of U into Rn that's close to the identity. Did that come from an ambient homeomorphism of the, of the space Rn? And could you have made that ambient homeomorphism if you didn't move U very far, like the identity outside some compact set? Sounds like sure, why not? Uh, but that's actually really tricky. Um, I'm happy to give you uh, proof of how to do this, at least in the easy case where you're really an RM, you know, in my manifold here, I might have some topology, especially in this iterate, careful not to screw up what you did before. Um, but uh, so the last problem on the problem set is ask me more about this if you haven't seen it before, because it's cool. Um, and uh, or not, because you're here for groups, not manifolds. And uh, I think we're out of time, though, for my first lecture. Thanks very much.